Hello, everybody. Welcome to our TLTS Research Seminar. Uh, we have been uh, met for a whole two months, and uh, I promise you we'll be meeting at least once in every two months. And before we dive into today's very, very interesting topic, I'd like to uh, announce our next seminars so that you won't forget. Um, our next seminar will be on September 25th, and uh, it will be um, Professor uh, Christiana dalton Puffer from the University of Vienna. And her topic tentatively is Cognitive Discourse Functions and Research in Content and Language Integrated Learning. And then two months from September, November 27, uh, also on Friday afternoon, uh, we will have um, Wolf Michael Roth from University of Victoria. And uh, he is a cognitive scientist, a very uh, interesting researcher, being a physicist, being a semiotics, uh, multi, multi, multiple uh, disciplines, and he will talk about transactional analysis and cause and effect causality, the, the myth of causality. And he will be joined by Paul Thibault, Professor Paul Thibault uh, from Norway. So it will really be transcontinental seminar. So, so our program is exciting this year. Okay, so. Um, the uh, announcement posters are on our YouTube channel. Okay, now today, back to our today's uh, guest. We are so exciting and we are so privileged to have um, Dr. Anna Marianovich Shen with us today, okay? <laughs> so um, Anna and I has been old friends, old friends. I don't want to mention how many years but we all belong to the sociocultural uh, mind action MCA's um, uh, circle. Yeah. So Bartinian scholar, Anna, is an independent scholar in Philadelphia and also an adjunct associate professor at University of Delaware. And where Biden comes from. <laughs> she is a deputy editor in chief for Dialogic Pedagogy and International Journal. Anna studies dialogic pedagogy and democratic education, so important for all of us all over the world now. What it means to have a democratic education and meaning making in education and play and dialogue and dialogic educational relationships. So I have such great respect for Anna because Anna's work really connects very deep, difficult ontology, epistemology, philosophy. But yet, Anna's work is so down to earth, down to the classroom, down to the playground, that everybody can understand. She uses such good examples to illustrate such deep philosophies. So that teachers, researchers, students can all understand philosophy is not scary. It is actually very important if we want to further the scholarship of democratic education, dialogue, and play. So without further ado, it's over to you, Anna. Okay, thank you for inviting me. I'm really very honored to be part of your seminar and to have an opportunity to talk to you and to Alessia, Bangi, Phoebe, and whoever else is watching us uh, yeah, now. So I want to start uh, yeah, uh, with a very short introduction into how I came to do what I'm doing and then give you an overview of this topic about uh, yeah, play and education from a uh, dialogic point of view. Uh, so uh, did you know that actually I am from a Han dynasty? Uh, did you know that? Uh, <laughs> my grandmother's last name was Han, so I'm also from the Han dynasty <laughs> in a way. And the uh, yeah, Han actually in my grandmother's name comes from German and means a rooster that uh, I looked up and that would be in Chinese, I think, C. Did I pronounce it right? <laughs> well, of course, my other grandmother had another bird name, Adler. And the, yeah, in that name, it's, an, it's a, actually an eagle. An eagle, a yin, yin, I am trying to pronounce in Chinese. 
Is that yeah. <laughs> it's okay. okay? So, so I, I uh, uh, you could say that I'm like, like a meow, meow, a bird, bird right? right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm flying I'm all around, around the world, world right, right now, and, and uh, uh, there is a reason that I'm saying all of that. that. Because I want to start with the, uh, the overview. I studied this whole study of a yeah, play because I was interested in word meaning. I was interested in how meaning is constructed, uh, how meaning is uh, not even constructed, how it springs out from nothing among people. From the very beginning of my studies when I was still in Yugoslavia, I come from Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, now living in United States since 1984, so, which is more than half of my life. So. <laughs> it could tell you something. Anyway, uh, I wanted to use these uh, sort of jokes because one of the very important things in my studies of meaning was that uh, yeah, um, I was wondering how is it possible to create a metaphor? How is it possible for very, very small children to create a metaphor? And in an example that I uh, uh, very often refer to, there was an episode that helped, happened to me when my nephew, who was at that time the first child in that generation of children, of my children and my brother's children, he was three years old, it was his third birthday, and he uh, was uh, among only the adults, uh, his parents and me and his grandparents and uh, uncles and, and aunts and everybody else. And at one point of time, my uncle, uncle his great uncle, asked him, who do you love the best? And he said, Nobody, because he didn't want to offend anyone. And in our uh, house, we lived together. Uh, he actually and I were the most closest um, at that point, even though he loved his parents and everything, but we played all the time. And so he said nobody very politically correct, not to in, in, insult anybody. But at that same moment, probably he thought that he might insult me. So he came and he pulled my ear down to uh, his level and he said, uh, whispering, you are nobody. <laughs> you are nobody, which, which was starting a play. So um, I was analyzing first that as kind of like a metaphor. How can a word nobody means somebody, means somebody who you love the best in the situation. But I was then captured of uh, looking at play. And uh, I read a lot, a lot of uh, uh, articles, books, uh, plays, uh, very important for Vygotsky. You all know that uh, very important uh, uh, paper by Vygotsky that the, uh, in play, children uh, uh, grow before they grow in reality. Uh, uh, and a play is a kind of like semiotic development, uh, development of meaning for the children. But I started to look at it not only on the level of symbols uh, and uh, yeah, uh, cognitively like that. I started to look at it as a, a interaction, as a kind of a relating to another person, because uh, yeah, you cannot really explain even metaphors unless you look at the whole totality of an event in which it happens. Uh, at that time, I also had a book by uh, Lewis Carroll. Are you familiar by, with Lewis Carroll and his Alice in Wonderland? How, how much are you also familiar, familiar with his book, uh, Through the Looking Glass? And he's a mathematician. And he was a mathematician, yes. In the Through the Looking Glass, uh, Lewis Carroll uh, writes something like this. Uh, uh, Alice, uh, Alice is talking, talking to the White, white King. King. In that, uh, that whole Through the Looking Glass is based on chess play. And the King tells her at one moment, uh, I haven't sent the two messengers either. They're both gone to the town. Just look along the road and tell me if you can see either of them. And Alice says, I see nobody on the road. And King says to her, I only wish I had such eyes to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too. Why? It is as much as I can do to see real people by this light. And so it's a kind of the same thing. 
that uh, Jorgen did, but also a very different thing, because for Lewis Carroll, that was a real word play. And when you read that, you don't have any personal, uh, it's a funny thing to say. It is a metaphor to say, but it doesn't have a social background behind that. There is nothing ontological about that. So being inspired by Bakhtin and his dialogism, I always wanted to look at how people relate to each other and the, uh, started to looking as me at the meaning, not only from this symbolic level, what refers to what, uh, how, what categories we have in our mind, how we can reconfigure categories, but what happens among people when things like that, uh, like that. So I uh, started to look at play as a kind of a, act that's addressed to another person. And we all know that children uh, really depend on play, many, many children in, in a way that it becomes their, their lifeline. If you don't want to play with them, it's almost like uh, the worst punishment, whoever that is. It is because this is where in play, you start to grow as a person. Not in the sense of Vygotsky only, but that's one of, of, of the very important thing to say. But in a sense that in that moment, you, uh, in the moment when play starts, uh, you suddenly are not anymore in one plane, like physical plane. You suddenly are both in imagination and in the physical plane and a very special relationship to a, to a person to, with whom you play. And that's why I started with the Han Dynasty that I belong to, so that I create this play situation with you, so that you know that uh, we are playing together tonight. So I thought that uh, many people who look at play look at just two things, like what's going on in play as an imaginary plane and what's going on in the reality and how one map on the other. And again, they miss with that personal relationship among people who play. So I thought there are really actually three worlds that happen at that moment. And they happen all together and they only depend on each other. So one is what are we constructing in this play, imaginary, in imaginary uh, realm or chronotope, and I'll tell you why I'm calling it chronotope. And the other one is at that moment, certain reality becomes a reality because we can, our whole lives, even when we are small, have so many things, we cannot focus on them. It doesn't really exist as reality, it's just a stream. In a moment of play, when you create a boundary between imaginary and the reality, you suddenly see both. So that for me, the reality is not real. It's something that becomes real in the moment of play, too, because you suddenly mirror it. You can suddenly look at it as if it exists. So what is for... Um, my nephew, when he said, you are nobody, suddenly it dawns on him that he has to tell me that I should not be offended because this relationship that's special between him and me, it becomes a focus for him and me to think about in a very funny way, in a very interesting way. So that's why I call this approach to play as a... Uh, ontological because it matters to people, not just because something is imagined, but because it really touches you in some way as a person and you touch another person as a per person. But at the same time, there is so much coordination because I call them not just worlds, but chronotopes and that's a Bakhtinian expression. A chronotope is a unity of time and space and a certain kind of value system that at the same time rules that world. What is uh, ethical or not ethical is different in play. In play, you can kill each other and you're not, a, a, as a person, you're not as ethically responsible. But in reality, whether you tell somebody you are nobody or no, not that, or how you treat them as a real co-player, a real friend, it matters. And you cannot easily erase what you have done, either positively or negatively. 
Some people even say that people with whom you played as a child or with whom you play have a special part in your life because they are closer than people who you're just collaborating with uh, and not really play. Because in play, we create parts of us as people and we create other people at the same time. So that's in the nutshell, the overview of, of this view of play, that there are three chronotopes, reality chronotope, play, imaginary chronotope, and the chronotope of the community of players that's made at that moment, that stays there, is part of you, and you can continue with people who, with whom you play, you can continue 10 years later as if there was no day in between, right? Okay, so... Uh, when I became interested uh, more into education, I was thinking, many people think that play is important to be part of education in order to make it more authentic, to engage children more, to make it funnier, to, to attract people. But there are certain things about play, which uh, are part of this explanation that I gave right now, that you cannot implement in education if you want to kind of put play into education because one of the most important things is that play is mutually voluntary that people who play can voluntarily stop to play and voluntarily enter and have to be invited also by the others to play so that this uh, relational part has no coercion if there is a coercion, it's a voluntary coercion. Like, I can accept that maybe Angel is my play boss. And whatever she says, I will accept that and I'll play her game because I want to do that. But at the moment when I don't want to do that and she starts to oppress me, I can say, I don't want to play anymore with you. But in education, unfortunately, students are not able to do that. And they are captured by somebody, and they know that it's not play. They may even enjoy it, but they know it's fake play. So the question is, uh, how can we look at education and, and use things that we know from play in such a way that it's useful for us in education? One of the big things that in education is done is that uh, uh, play is taught and used as a way to create drama, drama in education. And the, uh, I was engaged in through several years, maybe even decades, in drama in education in Yugoslavia, in the United States, too, and enjoyed it all the time. But I did it most of the time, not in school, but in after schools programs, the programs which were voluntary for the students who come there who wanted to do something like that. And I have read a lot uh, and seen a lot of uh, drama educators. One of the most important probably who, person who started drama in education it was Dorothy Heathcote or the, Dorothy Heathcote, the Brit British drama educator who was really brilliant and charismatic. And one of the things that she would do, she would play with students. She would not just be directing, but she would enter into a play as a character. So you could immediately see parallels that there is an imaginary world. There is a uh, world of players who play that. And there is some reality if you want to use, for instance, Dorothy Hathcote used the drama in education to teach uh, medieval history. So she would create a play around uh, a monastery, monks in monastery. They have to write a letter to a uh, request from the Pope, let's say something. And then everything, every detail was planned and she would teach through that all kinds of things. Medieval writing and penmanship and chemistry of the ink and all kinds of things were there. But the, the thing was that she was the author of that play world that she created and the students have to just fit in. And that was it. They could uh, play or not play. That was usually for Dorothy was not a, uh, a, cap a capturing them. But uh, still in, in the play world, there is a, uh, 
and in play too. There is a need to collaborate. There is a need to cooperate. And when you collaborate and cooperate, I don't know how much you're uh, familiar with the uh, uh, improvisation. One of the most important principles in the improvisation is that you have to build on what the person who is uh, improvising is building, is, is offering. So for in instance, let's say I say, Alessia, let's imagine that we are now in elevator. And, and then El Alessia, Say, what are we doing in the elevator? We are going up to the highest floor. Okay. Like the so, top one. Yeah. So uh, Alessia is accepting that we are in the elevator. She said, she didn't say, no, we are not in the elevator. We are in the, on the bottom of the ocean or something. Because that would immediately destroy this beginning of an imaginary current of. And so children in play struggle a lot. They, they very often stop and start to discuss, are we playing this or that? The, the goal in every spontaneous play is to not really break from the frame and to try to negotiate within. So Alessia would say, and the elevator is stuck. So we decided to go out by the stairs. <laughs> so, so that could be a kind of sub twist or not. But the whole thing is, if it's going to move someplace, you have to collaborate. You have to build together. You have to agree. And that's one of the ontological parts of the, of the uh, how we are directing this play as co-authors. We somehow have to find a way to collaborate. Children who don't collaborate, who don't want to play, the best thing is if they just leave, but if they don't leave and start to disturb us, they become spoil sports because they destroy everything for everyone and nobody can continue playing. So in play, children who don't collaborate uh, but want to stay, they may destroy everything. But in education, specifically dialogic education, people who uh, don't build on your thoughts but start to create alternative realities and say, no, 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 I don't agree completely with that, but maybe look at that and const constantly trying to bring new ideas that were not there. They are not saying yes and, they are saying no, but. <laughs> they could not play, but they are the best people for dialogue because one of the main things in dialogue is that we start to look at different alternatives bring many possibilities, points of view, uh, critically examine. And that's why we are not really playing. Although we constantly con con creating in imaginary chronotop, because each one of these possibilities is either imaginary or we are imagining it now, or we are even saying something like, uh, uh, what if? What if that, what if that, so that doesn't exist. So they're both at the same time, in education, you have the imaginary dialogue. You also have uh, imaginary chronotope. You also have the relationship between students and the teacher and among all of them. And plus relationship to the authors whose books we are reading. So that's, that's the uh, community of players. And we have reality about which we are talking. Are we talking about the ecology of today's world uh, or politics or what's going on in Hong Kong or what's going on uh, uh, in uh, uh, movies or something? There is something on, about which we are talking, but it's in a different relationship. So for the education, it's important to create this imaginary Chronotopes. But what we do with them is different than in play. We are not constantly building them and trying to create dramas or plays for them, their own sake. We are constantly bringing that to our reality to see what we think about that. What's better? What's not better? Is it possible? Is it not possible? Where is the evidence? And in that sense, education has to learn from play, but not to put the play always in education, but to engage people to use the imaginary chronotope as, as a springboard to understand the reality. So I would stop at this moment here. It's probably more than 10 minutes and open <laughs> for 
for your questions. Thank you so much, Honor. As I said, you are so capable of um, explaining something so philosophical in down-to-earth examples. So right now, we have um, student hosts um, from both Canada, my students in SFU, and also my students in Hong Kong U joining us. So over to you, Olesia, for you to ask some questions to Anna. Hi. Hello. For those who don't know me, I'm Olesia. <laughs> So um, I'm, uh, well, I'm always interested in the practical aspect. I uh, really enjoyed reading both of the articles and, present and also the presentation that you shared with us. And I see this, like this buildup and this development. So uh, talking about uh, dialogic education and play in education, um, am I understanding correctly that uh, drama in education and uh, play in education, these things are different and not like the same. That's that's my first question. Or are they like two sides of the same uh, coin, like two, two uh, aspects of the same um, phenomenon, the same notion? Well, in drama in education tries to dramatize uh, certain, let's say it's very good for, Literature is very good for history, it's very good for social sciences, because we can create human events uh, and then uh, by, by building them, we learn a lot about them. So it's always in the uh, service of learning something in order to create it. So creating this imaginary chronotope like, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know if you were able to, uh, in my PowerPoint presentation, see that little movie with Dorothy Hathcott, um, whether it played for you or not. Uh, so she was in that little movie uh, creating, she asked a group of children who she saw just the first time, about 11 to 12 years old, what would they like to play? They were all boys, and they said they wanted to play like a... Um, uh, prison camp. It's it's in the 60s and they still had this imaginary, imagery of the Second World War, uh, like war prison camp. And the, uh, in that, she immediately started to grab their attention, like, how do you take your gun up? How do you put it down? You have to depend on the gun. You, you This is you who are a soldier. So she starts to put the children in a situation that's very tangible, but imaginary. Later on in that, uh, yeah, you can watch it on, on YouTube. Uh, I will send you the whole link. Uh, uh, she created behind the scenes that one of, the soul, uh, of these children is going to be a snitch and a spy. And they didn't even know. So <laughs> there is a lot, a lot of going, things going on. But the point is, uh, drama in education tries to build the imaginary plane as such. And everything is subordinated to that. The children uh, or students' ca uh, own needs, characters, uh, what they would like. There is a scenario that the teacher or the history or whoever uh, is, uh, presents to the students that they have to uh, make alive. Now, this is very different from regular play in which children could go any way they want. It doesn't have to be realistic. It could be grotesque. It could be, usually is kind of like a commentary on their, te on their teachers or parents or other people in very funny ways. For instance, I had a younger friend when she was, uh, I was seven years older than her. So when she was five, she uh, six, she started school. I was 14 and I was watching her play and she would put all her stuffed animals on a couch and then start to uh, teach them and beat them. And you could see, uh, but she was not doing it to imitate the teacher, but kind of like almost with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, commentary on the teacher. Now you all know about TikTok, <laughs> right? And you maybe have seen uh, some of the impersonations of Trump by the um, Sarah, um, uh, a female actress who uses Trump's uh, voice and then she talks. But what she does with her body and with, with her mimic gives another dimension to the meaning of his words. And it's a commentary on what she really thinks. So we could think about, she 
tries to uh, uncover what he tries to cover, maybe. And that's what we can do in play. In, when, when that same process is taken in education, it does not give you that freedom because that kind of a student who would start to take it on a level that was beyond what teacher thinks is right would be a spoiled sport. And uh, for instance, uh, one, of a, uh, uh, one of our colleagues, I think Alessia and Phoebe know him from our uh, meetings uh, on Thursdays with Eugene, Mark Smith, who was Eugene's student, he uh, uh, had a very big research on drama in education exactly used for uh, exploring the Silk Route. And when some of the students started to invent new things that were not in the history, the teacher just stopped that. So they could be trading with each other, like uh, some silk coming from China, but it has to come to the Middle East and to be exchanged from some incense or something, and then to come to Europe. And they would start inventing some other things, and she just stopped that. So uh, one of the things in drama in education is that uh, it's a uh, very often taken as a closed, already premeditated uh, by the teacher uh, end point and exploration that uh, would be in regular un uncontrolled play would not be always completely accepted. Even though it could potentially even lead to discoveries in history that historians didn't mean, right? So yeah. it's very interesting how it's different. And so in that sense, spoil sport for education, especially dialogic education that tries to create critical meaning, tries to bring alternative points of view, tries to, to destroy what we ri know right now and to see it in a new way or to use it in a new way for that today is, uh, is actually banking on these destroyers of the imaginary one imaginary sport sport always brings alternative possibilities it's not good for play itself maybe for children's play if other other children go along with somebody's new offers and they can transform playing mommy and daddy or whatever they are playing into suddenly a a uh, let's say star trek or something like that or combine things that come from any different hilarious things or stop or whatever uh, you cannot do that in school if the school is trying to have a final end point that everybody has to come to. Right. So does it mean that it's impossible to uh, like marry or put together a play and a dialogic education? Does it mean that it's completely impossible or there is still a way? What do you think? No, I think that it's possible because, for instance, Dorothy Hathcott, I uh, told you about how she's doing that, and you can watch that in the movie, but we can create an imaginary world. We can maybe even create it exactly like uh, you, the teacher wanted to create, or not the teacher, maybe uh, that was what we know about history, but we have to then switch the mode and allow critical approach to that. And so what we do in creating a uh, dr dramatizing something, or uh, let's say, um, I don't know uh, whether you read an article that uh, uh, Eugene and I wrote about creativity from dialogic point of view. And I think in that article, we use Eugene ex uh, uh, example that uh, about math. You would think that math is just the uh, most strict science or, or, or discipline where there is no alternative point of view, right? Two and two is what? Depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but so if, if a child says, you know, like two and two is five, and you say you're wrong, you have not engaged the child into a cre creative and critical thinking, critical thinking and critical dialogue and creati creativity go hand in hand. 
critical dialogue, uh, it depends on playfulness of everybody because we suddenly have to say, well, let's try something completely crazy. Let's think it this way. But then we use it to kind of Know, like illuminate things, bring some new ways of thinking. It's not necessarily always successful, but no, there is no guarantee that we will always discover something new. But at least uh, a person who is engaged in critical uh, uh, reflection and critical dialogue has an, a chance to develop what Bartin called internally persuasive discourse. I don't know how you all familiar. I see very many people nodding because it's you who are this, uh, looking at all these possibilities and then you're deciding what for you is most truthful, like what, what you personally think based on all the evidence, based on all the alternatives, what you think is really for you the truth. Everything else, you just believe other people who told you that, and maybe you agree with that, but it's not deeply yours. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that everything in life should be learned in a critical way. That's another thing, because there are many things that we rely on believing other people. We cannot all just ex examine everything, or as we used to say in Yugoslavia, discover America about everything. <laughs> It's so good that uh, Olasia raised such a good question and honors raising this internally persuasive discourse, this idea from Bakin, uh, oh, versus well. the authoritative discourse. And so it brings, it brings me to the idea of this Indian scholar, post-colonial scholar, Gayatri Spivak. And one uh, yeah. famous saying of her is, education or learning is non-coercive rearrangement of desires. So as teachers or whoever, parents, educators, you want to rearrange the desires of someone, okay? Or your boyfriend, girlfriend, you want to rearrange their desires, but you don't want to use coercion. So you would draw on Bakhtin's idea yeah. of internally yeah. persuasive yeah. discourse yeah. rather than the teacher authoritative teacher authoritarian authoritative discourse, because I'm a teacher. So you have to rearrange your desires according to my agenda. So that's a very good question. Now let's move on to- I, yeah. Just, Oh, that's another yeah. question. Yeah, Olesia, sorry, so yeah. No, that, uh, yeah, Olesia, another question. Oh, one, one more. <laughs> Oh, oh, one, uh, we want to give you. Uh, Alicia, you can come back. Let's have Phoebe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 give everyone the, the chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can take. We can always uh, have multiple ranks. We let's uh, let Alicia take a rest. Okay. Phoebe, your turn. <laughs> So um, actually, I'm interested in following up uh, your discussion about sport sport uh, because uh, you explain very clearly about the values, the critical perspective about having uh, the sports sports uh, players to interact with other players who would prefer rules keeping or order keeping through drama education. But how about how to motivate teachers or parents to accept the values behind sports sports? Uh, because uh, a lot of uh, parents or teachers, when they arrange drama education or play at school, they use uh, drama or play as a tool to train up their students for collaboration, for keeping discipline, because you need to remember the script and then memorize the lines and then train up your uh, maybe English speaking or Mandarin speaking. So what would you see about uh, the potentials behind if you introduce uh, dialogic practices and also the values of having those sports sports uh, players around and encourage them to interact with their very uh, straightforward rule keeping players? What would be the values behind for parents and teachers? Well, for parents and the teachers, the value would be that the students would have an opportunity to develop their own 
uh, their own views and the critical views about themselves, about the world, about everybody else. But of course, the risk is there for people who only want uh, the students and children to obey the rules that exist and norms, that they would open that door and, and provide a door out of that. And so uh, it's... Uh, it's a matter of the whole culture. If the student, if the parents or the teachers uh, actually want to provide freedom to the students to make their own mind, honestly, <laughs> without uh, coercing them into believing something that I, you just have to believe what I believe and everything else is wrong. If I do, if I give you the opportunity to make up your own mind to believe. Even if I may not agree with you, uh, we may discuss. We can, I can, I can bring all my evidence why I believe, like I believe. Uh, in dialogue, the teachers and the parents have to be ready to re-examine their own beliefs, their own values that they may have not done that in their whole life. Maybe they have also only believed what they were told, and suddenly their world can throw, be thrown into a big turmoil. So yes, it's not an easy thing to do that, uh, especially when a culture uh, around the school, around the whole society is an authoritarian culture where um, uh, thinking outside the box could be dangerous and could destroy many things. It's uh, not an easy thing. But uh, very often we know that uh, yeah, uh, uh, people who put themselves uh, with their children or with their students on a level that let's all together look at something honestly. And they are then, uh, one of Bakhtin's uh, uh, notions was uh, consciousness is with equal rights. So that your opinion and my opinion, obviously they may be based on different uh, backgrounds, on different experience, but they have to have an equal rights to come out and to be seriously taken. For instance, so if the child says two and two is five, instead of saying you're wrong, you can say, what makes you think that? Show me how is it possible, but serious. And maybe they will be able to do that because in some situation, yes, there are sometimes, you know, two and two sometimes cannot be even decided. Because like, let me tell you an example, two friends and two friends, how many friends? When you put two friends and two friends together, how many friends are you going to get at the end? Uncertain. Uncertain. So, see, two and two is not always four. It sometimes is uncertain. Sometimes it can be one. Sometimes it can be two and three. But if uh, I was teaching, uh, I was actually uh, not teaching. I was uh, in a presentation like this one, uh, but face to face with some people, and I went with that through that whole example very thoroughly. And one of the teachers who was part of our, uh, this workshop, she said, why didn't I learn mathematics like that? I would love mathematics. <laughs> because suddenly, you know, suddenly you, you engage somebody heart to heart, head to head. Let's think of it together. When is it true? When is it not true? What are, under what circumstances? Why? You know, and some people may not be interested in that, and that's fine too. Like, I don't really want to learn uh, uh, organic chemistry, and no matter how much people would try to engage me, I would feel that it's uh, like a boring thing for me to learn <laughs> and not want to engage. But uh, if, if uh, I would have a chance uh, to participate in something that kind of matters to me, uh, I would really prefer, and probably many of you, that, that what you think uh, is taken not, uh, it doesn't have to be right or wrong, but serious. That's like idea. Let's see how it works. And you can ask any question. Uh, there is no reason to, to think that uh, yeah, if you ask a question, you will uh, show that you are disrespectful or that you are a uh, 
ignorant. In many schools, children don't ask questions because if they don't know, they'll show that they are ignorant and so they're afraid to even ask a question. Hi. Hi, April. <laughs> Hi, April. Um, welcome into Hi. your Zoom room. Since you have been typing in questions, I think it would be good for you to ask the questions face to face. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, actually, may, uh, thank you very much for your interesting and inspiring explanations um, on these concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, but may I ask about uh, something from your uh, 2016 article, um, Spoiled Sport in Drama in Education versus Dialogic Pedagogy? Um, I, I, I read and I quote, um, there is no presupposition in the critical ontologic dialogic pedagogy that the imaginary or imagined worlds I see need to be jointly constructed or jointly performed by the participants. So could you um, further explain on this? And my second question is, also you mentioned uh, right afterwards, uh, and I quote, any imagined chronotope is understood in DP not in terms of an as a world of joint presence, but rather as one of the potentially many hypothetical what if worlds. So can you give some ex examples of encouraging what if worlds in the classroom? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting questions. So we were talking before about the drama in education, which is usually based on some uh, uh, even when it's an improvisation, we have to choose a theme and we have to construct the presentation of some coherent imaginary world. We can do it more if it's in education, it could be for history, it could be for dramatizing a, uh, uh, literature, it could be sociology. We can now, let's say, we, we want to repeat uh, some experiment psychological and I can say, like, let's say Angel will be this and Alessia will be this and April will be this. And so then we reenact what was happening or what we think it's hip and we have to collaborate to create something that can stand, that, that, that's a coherent world. And if it's for drama in education, you're creating one and you have to collaborate in order to create one coherent world. In, in the critical dialogic pedagogy, you can create different ideas. I don't have to coordinate with April and I say, what if, what if we in this uh, experiment do this? And, and um, Phoebe may say, no, 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 let's, uh, what if we do this? And the uh, uh, angel says, no, 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 uh, I think this should be. So we don't have to coordinate. We can then, co co uh, we can uh, superimpose each on the each and then think about what would be better? Why would it be better? Uh, what would be worse? Why worse? Uh, uh, or maybe both of those don't, somebody gets inspired for something completely different. So we, we don't have to coordinate one what if world or imaginary chronotope. We can bring a lot of different ideas and throw them there uh, and they will change everything else. So our disagreements uh, uh, and non-coordination can actually deepen and deepen and deepen different layers of our examination. But always we have to bring, it, imaginary in this sense means it doesn't have to be really imaginary, it could be something, let's say, uh, that you have as an experience, April, and I don't. And you just bring that and says, no, no, but in my house or whatever, when I was a child or uh, uh, I experienced something that uh, is not compatible with what you are now presenting as truth. And that's great because then we can say, well, wait a moment. Then so what we are thinking is not always true, but then, how is it possible? Is it okay or not okay? Is it something, what we are talking about, something that's some kind of eternal truth or something that's very local, so anything can be? And, uh, or we, don't, we just want to understand how you think and why you think like that. What in your world made you think? Is that a good answer? You have to unmute yourself, April. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. Oh, she did. April, are you going to have a follow-up question? Or you can come back later. Another question? Or you have a follow-up 
Bongi has a question. Okay, over to you, Bongi. Bongi is uh, Dr. Bongi Song is uh, one of our postdoc fellows in SFU Canada. Um, thank you, Anna, for elaborate discussion on the play and chronotop and um, drama education and dialogic education. So I am still grappling with um, some of your discussion. And, and if you don't mind, um, could you please elaborate what is the definition of play and how is it similar or different from other, other genres like such as storytelling or game? What, I, what is the scope of the play? In, in your terms? Oh, thank you for that. Also a very important question. So uh, in English, there are two words for play, play and game. I don't know whether in uh, your, your language there are two words. In my Serbian language, actually, there is only one word. But we still all know that there are some plays that are improvisational, like pretend play. Like uh, uh, we can say, okay, uh, let's play visit to a doctor like little children. So you're a doctor, I'm a patient, or my doll is a patient and I'm a mother. And that's a theme. Now so something so starts to get improvised. You can kind of, hello. And the doctor says, what's the matter with your baby? And you can say, it has a tummy ache. Or whatever. So there is uh, some kind of scenario that, uh, from experience, children know, uh, but it's it, very loose. It could go various unusual ways uh, and completely out of reality. There is no prescription that you have to stay on that scenario. Or you can start a play without completely just, we don't even know what we are playing, and we just start humming and dancing and then out of that you can say okay here is a stage and I'll, all kinds of things can happen there is no uh, reason to follow any scenario and so this whole practice in terms of uh, Aristotle could be called uh, open practice or he called it praxis where what's good for this praxis is not prescribed before but comes out of the whole activity. And we can have a great time. And when you ask, uh, what did you do? We cannot tell anybody because we laughed together, told jokes and uh, played funny faces. And maybe there were some dialogues or whatever came out of that and we just had a great time. So whether it's good or not, uh, what did it mean for us? Maybe it's all just about like uh, uh, having, uh, uh, laughing a lot or something like that. Uh, it's praxis. There are other kinds of games and play that are more structured, especially called games with rules. And this is one thing that Vygotsky talked about, that there are games with rules and that every play is about rules, really. Just depends on how uh, constrained these rules are. So if you're playing some sports, uh, if you're playing chess, or if you're playing video games, everything that's pre-designed and it has its internal logic, it's actually according to a, uh, Aristotle, poiesis. It's uh, spelled P-O-I with two dots, E-S-I-S, -S, poiesis. Uh, the word poetry comes from that uh, notion because poetry has to have a certain rhythm that's pre, like if you're writing sonnets or in haiku, you have to have, you have very strict rules that you have to follow, but internal, inside of those rules, there is a possibility for improvisation, but everything is preset and whether something is good or bad depends on how well you achieve these rules with these rules, the end of the game. And this is poesis. Now, education is based on poesis, co contemporary education, because we know what end goals we want to achieve, right? This is co uh, contemporary authoritarian and also progressive education. We know what's okay to do, what are the norms, what are the rules, how we do. We have methods of teaching, which is how to do things in what order, uh, uh, what does it mean that students are doing well or not? We have pre preset our 
evaluations and everything. So real play, improvisational play, is really antithetical to this classic uh, uh, education. Drama in the education also very often is based on poesis, especially if it's used for teaching history, teaching sociology, teaching literature. Storytelling also, in many ways, is also um, poesis because uh, it's very interesting about storytelling. It depends on certain rules that we teach our students all the time. Like there should be a beginning, there should be a, a say or an overview, then give little uh, parry, like five paragraph composition. I don't know whether you teach that in, uh, in uh, Korea, in China. Bongji, where are you from? I'm from Korea. Okay, uh, so this is typical Western way of teaching storytelling, and they start teaching little children even from like kindergarten in show and tell, like uh, tell me what you did this summer. So you can say I went to a uh, workshop on uh, creating puppets. That's the beginning, and well, I uh, there was a man who showed me how to t put a uh, something on my hand like a, a sock, and, and so I could start telling you and elaborate. I made this kind of, I made a mouse and my mother made a cat or something like that. But that's very cultural and there are rules behind. So storytelling, because it's not joint improvisation, has to follow certain rules in order to be in some cultures intelligible. There are other rules, and maybe you all know from some ancient stories uh, or Zen Buddhism or something like that, that you can start completely different. You can start from something that's, that will lead to something else and something else, and maybe say some, something in between that completely seems unrelated. But at the very end, you will be circling, circling from outside until you come to the center. But from the beginning, you don't know what is it about. And there are studies about how culturally dependent are these different narratives. But my point is also that they are poesis because there are certain written or unwritten rules uh, learned in the culture, sometimes just by osmosis because you're exposed to that and nobody's telling you, but uh, in order to be a good storyteller, you have to kind of fa fall in these rules. But in some ways, though, um, play student has um, children has to draw on some kind of cultural resources in order to make the play sense. Sure. So, yeah. for example, you mentioned about the doctor patient play, and that's also very culture specific in that yeah. way. So I'm not quite sure how okay. it's different from storytelling that you describe. Is it particular to the form? of the, how it's structured, or is it the, the resources that students create in order to make meaning? Okay, so what I think about the yeah, play is when you use the culture and cultural uh, patterns as a food for transcending that, or to give your own commentary on that by making it as a caricature, by making it as a grotesque, by making it into something that it was not before, either through different pattern or uh, different uh, yeah, meaning whatsoever. Uh, so you are not just consuming the culture and cultural patterns, but you are also producing them because you are creating something new out of these existing things. And if in education you open that door where students can create something new for real and not just um, as part of uh, their road to come to what you want them to come to, <laughs> then you're creating an ability to use this playfulness, let's say more, in order to critically examine, to destroy everything. You know, a good player destroys everything too in order to build something new. And that's why spoil sport. <laughs> Honor, um, 
In a world of uh, ideal situation, people cooperate, collaborate to play. But Bongi just mentioned, uh, children might be coming from different subcultural groups. And yes. They have different values, different norms. Mm -hmm. And if they all struggle to have my norm, my cultural norm, to be the one that is you need to, so that it will lead to kind of a war game among the children? Or Necessarily, among you know, if, if children from different cultures in our world where we have a lot of immigrants in uh, many different cult countries where the people move much more on maybe on mass uh, compa and fast compared to uh, other times in history. So we suddenly can talk with people from all different cultures and go to school with people with uh, all different cultures and meet them. One of the things that uh, it could be, uh, it could lead to tensions and it does. Tensions don't have to be always bad because they could lead to making something new. And for instance, throughout history, we knew, know about new languages that were created from people who couldn't speak each other's language, called Creole languages, because one culture will a, a, a encounter another culture. And so you could collaborate. Collaboration is very important too. And that's why play it opens a way to collaborate. I'm not saying that only one side is good, the other is bad. I'm just saying that each one of them has their, its own domain and its own good parts of that. Yeah, I'm just, yes, I understand. I'm just thinking of the role of the teacher or the parent or whatever, that if we allow a group of children to just to have this emergent play worlds, ICs, and we could, of course, let them emerge, let the children negotiate. Mm -hmm. But some children start bullying, you know, like in your PowerPoint, that the two older girls starts to bully the younger one, saying that I'm the doctor, you're the patient, you have to drink this as a medicine, whereas this is a pee, okay? <laughs> that it's just, it's bullying, but using uh, play as a justification to bully you, because you're the patient, yeah. you listen to the doctor. Yeah. So, um, so does, does it uh, warrant the adult? be a teacher or parent to jump in to say, no, 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 you should not bully in the play world. You shouldn't, you shouldn't use your whole play as a justification to bully. To right. Bully. Uh, I also wanted to, I use that example uh, because there is another thing that we as educators, especially since we got on, started to look at play as some kind of magic uh, pill that everything is beautiful about it. It just creates this beautiful world. Everything is like uh, beautiful flowers and imagination is the best thing in the world. And uh, yeah, we just grow from it. And I was, I'm a student of Brian Sutton Smith. I don't know how many of you heard about Brian Sutton Smith, who was an anthropologist and a, a ethnographer of children's play from New Zealand originally, but most of his work he did in the United States. And he always told us play is dangerous. There are there is evil play. Uh, play is not something that in itself has any value, only good value. Just like everything else, you can use it for bad stuff. And like science, also you can create bad things too. You know, with science, not just good things. Okay. And so, so, well. so everything that we as human beings do can have a dark side. So as an educator, when will you uh, enter children's world and when will you let them to, uh, to be good or bad? And in what way? That's another story. I don't think that we have enough time for that too. But I would say that the, uh, um, for me, looking from the point of view of play, in the way how I'm looking at these uh, chronotopes, that there is imaginary world and there is a uh, uh, community of players and there is a, 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 that reality about which we talk. There is a big ethical difference between being in the imaginary world and being in the community of players. Because in your own chronotope, which is real, which is your, you with other people, you're doing things to other people. 
like in those uh, th those girls asking another girl to to drink the pee because it's me medicine what they're doing they're breaking the boundary between the imaginary world and the real world now the boundary is very important because in the imaginary world we are not ethically responsible we are outside as authors we are looking at this imaginary world as our creation, it could be on screen, it could be in the theater, it could be just pretend. We don't have to use the real pee. We can say this is pee, but we could use juice, you know, <laughs> for reality to give it, re or we can use nothing, you know, like empty cup, like let's drink it or something like that. So in the imaginary world, as imagined people or imagined characters, we don't have an ethical uh, uh, obligation. But in the real life, we do. We, uh, authors kill their heroes all the time. You can tell a story and make it sad and everybody is killed like in Hamlet. At the end, everybody dies. We will not say that Shakespeare was an, an unethical writer because he did that, but yeah. that he presented it for some purpose of us to think about that. But because play and drama and everything has this... Uh, community of players in which real people are doing something to each other in a way that matters. Like, if, am I, even when we play ball, am I going to give you the ball or I'm going to shoot it to Qinghua or something? And am I going to never give Olesia the ball? That may be something that she can then feel that I'm not liking her. Yeah, honor, honor, yeah. Uh, I remember there is this Tim Lensmeer writing about this book about children. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is this classroom scenario. Whenever they do drama, the, the, the bullying children always ask this child to play the Christmas tree. Uh -huh. but it's a kind of bullying. Now, it's not like drinking pee. But it's always uh, in your IC, these bullies always cast a weaker peer in a very submissive or inanimate, you will be the Christmas tree. Now, is it also bothering on reality See, That is, it's not just physically asking you to drink pee or mm -hmm. throwing a ball to you to hurt you, but psychologically, if I always cast you in this, in this role, which is, uh, which is a really negative role, it's also hurting the, the yeah. peer. See, and this is where I think it's very hard to uh, to differentiate who is doing what to whom. So it's a real person doing something to another real person by using play to put them in a certain situation. In play itself, some characters there may need to be Christmas tree. Somebody needs to be that. I actually have another very, uh, very funny anecdote from um, Helen Schwartzman that uh, she observed in Chicago among the group of six years olds where uh, there was a new child who came and he didn't know English. He just spoke uh, Spanish and they didn't want to play with him. But the teacher insisted that they put him into the play because they, they should make him a player. And so this girl who was the play boss, she said, oh, okay, because the teacher made her do that. You will be the goldfish. So what he, and he was very happy. He liked that. So he could stand on the side and just not say anything. He could just. Okay, so it depends. It depends. So bullying happens in reality or in play worlds or in ICs and RCs. Yeah, it's nothing to do with play itself. Play can be right. used yeah. just like anything. Yeah. Bullying happens in your dream world too. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Qinghua has a question. Qinghua, Qinghua, related to this. Qinghua, could you ask a question? Yes, um, my question is actually, I feel like uh, the one of the functions of the play could be providing a space and a, a relative safer space for children and students to explore uh, the experiences that were not possible in reality, even though sometimes these experiences could be could be negative, like bully or something. But do you still see the benefits of it with some limits and line, of course? so that uh, uh, the play can enable children to explore things that they were not possible to do in reality. Thank you. 
Of course, uh, uh, play uh, gives a possibility to explore things uh, that wouldn't be okay to explore in reality. Uh, and uh, and it, it's also risky <laughs> because it's not completely always safe. There are all kinds of uh, plays. And my, my advisor, uh, Sutton Smith, told me about initiation games among young uh, preteen boys in New Zealand. So, uh, like, who is the most uh, yeah, tough guy <laughs> among those 11-year-olds? You know, like, they would take a cat by the tail. And then if you can bring your face near, 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 so how near can you get it until that cat starts scratching you? H how much do you dare, you know? And this to show how brave you are or something like that. Of course, uh, yeah, children uh, play all kinds of things that adults would find appalling and hide that very well from adults uh, and the teachers, even in the classroom. You probably also know from your own experience how much you can hide things from the teachers in the classroom or in the schoolyard. And uh, children do need, uh, one of the things that you think about is uh, when you think about what is going on in the group of players is very important to find your place among other people, right? And uh, some of the, that, it could be dangerous. Some of that does not have to be dangerous, but it's always something that is ontologically important. And uh, sometimes it's ontologically important and dangerous. And if, if that's the case, the teachers um, may not even see it. Uh, uh, there is another very interesting book by my friend, Anna Beresin, uh, called The Recess Battles. And she observed children in uh, one school in West Philadelphia for a long time and found in the, in the outside in the yard various plays that they did and various battles that they had between themselves, uh, among themselves and between them and the teachers and the uh, principal. So for instance, they played one game that was called the killer ball where you, sh when you throw a, a ball at somebody with strong, strong, so that it really hits them like a small tennis ball. And the teachers forbid that because it was dangerous. Some kids got uh, injured and cried, but they always played it. They would just go around the corner uh, of the house. Uh, teachers cannot be everywhere because it was very important for them to play. Now, the whole uh, thing of bullying is a completely different topic, and I would like to reserve it for some other time because <laughs> bullying can be through play and without play. But what play achieves is uh, being able to find out who you are among other people and also to create these uh, fantastical worlds that you can later on or at that time, if you're using them to figure something about the reality, that's good. Uh, or if you're suddenly using them to find something new about the reality that nobody else knew before. Uh, it's also known that some of the very important uh, scientific discoveries come from children's play, that, that the, the scientists played in their youth, and then later on in life, they had some idea from what they did. Good. Arnie, uh, Arnie, uh, Dr. Arnie Spratling, a uh, postdoc uh, fellow in SFU in Canada, has a question about time, space, and play. Arlene, over to you. Hello. Um, uh, you just missed my daughter. She was playing right here. Um, <laughs> and my question was inspired by what you were just talking about, space and time. So um, I'm right now, I was conducting some research about play during COVID and how my own experience of my, my child having a really hard time with virtual play. And I read a bunch of research about gaming and how and how when you were talking about, well, in gaming, that space and time, uh, that realm that you enter it, it is different than, let's say, a child talking to another child on Facebook or on FaceTime. Is it because they're missing 
in, in your with your research, is it because they're missing that space time realm where it's more fluid and they're still half in like one world and half in this virtual world? That could be. I, I really don't know. It's a very new thing, not only COVID, but the whole technology and our communication through uh, technology on FaceTime or Zoom. And uh, on one hand, it really enables us to do a lot of things, like when we are now talking across the whole world. Like we are, with uh, people in Hong Kong, it's uh, it's uh, tomorrow already. They are in our future now. So they are in April, in August 1st and they can tell us how they feel from there. But at the same time, we are not fully there. We don't have our privacy. Uh, play very often is not for the audience. It's not for anybody else. You need to really be private with people with whom you play because it's not performance, but something between you to construct. And how you now use technology and whether we can, in what terms we can use it to create that private space I don't think that we know yet or that uh, we have created uh, completely good uh, ways to do that. But on the other hand, we don't know because it's possible. I think it's possible, but I don't know under what circumstances. For sure, the smaller children uh, probably would miss, we all miss real feel and touch of people, their whole body language, their, you know, like their small twitches or something in order to, uh, we are after all really very dependent on really being with other people to be who we are. So I don't know I'm, uh, that whether they will create like holographic spaces where you can be private. Would you let your child to be private with somebody like you would let them be private with a friend and not always hover over them, right? But would you do that uh, with technology? I don't know. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. My real interest is in play, so this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Very much. Okay, um, here's a question, actually many questions from Amy Wu. Amy Wu is my PhD student from the University of Hong Kong. Amy, over to you. Uh, oh, hello, Anna. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk with you um, uh, since you are a uh, Bactinian scholar. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, relatively new to the notion of uh, chronotope. So I <clears throat> wonder if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on this notion of chronotope and what you see as its value to education and, and educational research. For example, like compare with notions like uh, time scales, uh, uh, process-based ontology, or the spatial new materialist or orientation, which are all emerging themes in the educational research scene. So, so this is my first question. And, and then the second would be, how does this notion of chronotope relate to other key Bactinian notions like uh, dialogue, uh, hitoglossia? Um, and then my third question um, is kind of a, <laughs> related to hitoglossia. We, um, it's actually also a question that I last time I would like to ask Professor Motosov, but uh, kind of uh, due to uh, time limits. It's the, it seems that um, there's a problem of like mistranslation of this term in English. Is that like how does it compare uh, with intertextual <coughs> intertextuality? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so I guess <laughs> I would like to grab also this opportunity to ask for your clarifications, uh, hitoglossia and intertextuality, and also a notion proposed by uh, Professor Matusov about like hito, hito is it like something like all, all these kind of like, notions. Yeah, Thanks okay. a lot for your Okay, well, uh, can I now share one of my slides, uh, Qinghua? Uh, that has a, yeah, okay. So I'm going to share uh, uh, something uh, from one of my presentations about play chronotope because there is a good definition there of, can you see it, uh, Amy and everybody else? 
So chronotope uh, uh, for Bakhtin is a systematic unity of time, space, and axiology or value system. Although Bakhtin mostly said in the beginning time and space, uh, he probably inferred, but Matusov was the first one who actually added that axiology. It's not just time, space, uh, some kind of empty system, but uh, yeah, it has its uh, value, uh, values, rules, norms uh, that, that are there. So for instance, being in school is one axiology there and being at home is different. Like what you can do in school is different than what you can do in, at home. Uh, how you dress, how you walk, how you talk to people and everything. So Bakhtin defined it, it's the place where the knots of narrative are tied and untied. Uh, because he was talking about really novels when he was designing that. So, so when things really happen, time, as it were, thickens, takes on flesh, becomes artistically visible. Likewise, space becomes charged and responsive to the movements of time, plot, and history. So think about whatever is very important book for you or play, uh, something that you know. So uh, very important uh, um, narrative there for instance in hamlet when he to be or not to be and that's whole uh, maybe that's not important for you but uh, think about anything else that's for you so chronotope is defined with events that can happen in in, in the chronotope in a certain way and where these events are transformational in some ways because they matter, they, it's not just empty time and space. So for instance, you can think about uh, uh, time and space, let's say a, uh, a field that has certain little bumps uh, and uh, I'm looking at that field and I could see beauty uh, with some birds around, maybe a tree here and there. But you, if I was a military commander, and I was going to assess that some battles where my soldiers will be engaged will take place in that field. I would not look at it as a beautiful field, but I would look where the other soldiers may ambush me, uh, how fast my soldiers can move across that. So in that sense, that's a chronotope. It's a different chronotope. So in a classroom, for instance, you can have a classroom in which uh, uh, you can't say anything. The teacher is talking and telling you what to write down. And there are very strict rules of how you, if you want to say something, you have to raise your hand. And there is a certain whole setup what that class allows you to do as a person and where your position to the teacher to other student is. Uh, you can have a different class in which, let's say, uh, you can do whatever you want. And the teacher says, just like, form small groups and talk in these groups about something. And you can talk about anything. And there could be a lot of things going on. And it's a different chronotope. So that's what is a chronotope. Uh, Bakhtin tried to capture that in the literature. We are trying to capture that in ways to, uh, to say, this is what's... Uh, a world in which something can happen or not happen and gives the whole meaning to whatever is happening. Is that a good uh, uh, answer to you, Amy, about what's correct? So I, I look at play as this unique time space value of an event rather than a universal uniform of measurable dimensions. So each event creates its own chronotope. And uh, I look at play through this lens of a quality of the experience. So if, if you're talking about these girls who are bullying another girl, uh, it's a different kind of experience for them, different for these little girl, uh, the other little girl. Uh, and because they are crossing between two chronotopes, like chronotope among the players has certain ethical events, like whether I should pass the ball to you or not pass the ball to you, whether I should put you to be a Christmas tree or not a Christmas tree, whether I should give you a very important role to do that, whether you can make decisions, uh, who is the boss or do, don't we have a boss? This is authoring and co-authoring, like we are working on something as co-authors and how we treat each other. It's a different chronotope from what's going on in the play. In there could be all kinds of interesting things. 
we can take some note from what's going on in the play to inform us about la our lives. We can kind of, would, uh, to answer Qinghua, uh, safely explore uh, what would it mean to be unethical to somebody unless we cross it back into the, our real uh, re relationships. So as long as it stays pretend, and in that pretend, it does not uh, kind of like really make you have a scratched face by a cat or something like that. It's fine. <laughs> but that's uh, that's why event in the imaginary uh, uh, place can inform something about our us, but it's uh, not binding. It can be just like nothing happened there. We don't know. A good player is somebody who can raise your experience to really like going full time, like you laugh to the until you fall on the ground, or you suddenly fall in love with the other players because they bring something uh, that you never expected and it's so good for the play, or something like. Or somebody else who you don't really like because they are constantly uh, bothering you because uh, of their either bad cooperation or not synchronizing time or whatever. So it has this dramatic quality that then over uh, overpowers us both in the imaginary and in the reality. And because it's very complex, it's two different worlds uh, uh, that we are transferring. And the third one we call reality because it's about something in reality, like scenario from the doctors, what's possible, what's not possible, something if you want to stay with that. Uh, it's a yeah, very complex thing to do. And sometimes uh, these uh, uh, chronotopes can be mixed up. If you think about then in school and educational chronotopes, when they're good and when they're uh, not good, like what, what we are doing, we are constructing in the authoritarian and in the uh, pro progressive education, this imaginary chronotope, you can think of it as curriculum. <laughs> the world, like, where are we now? We are in the 16th century. That's where we are in the history at this moment, you know. So <laughs> the imaginary chronotope is the curriculum. And uh, the, the community of players is how the teacher is treating you, how you are treating, what you can do as a student as co-authoring that or not. So, Amy, does it answer your question? Amy. Ah, she also asked about heterodiscorsia, heteroglossia. Um, the, uh, the, uh, it's hetero because it has these many voices coming from many different angles. Sometimes it's a, uh, a character in the play is saying something to other characters in the plays, but that becomes important for how we are collaborating. And sometimes it's real Anna talking to real Amy about how we're going to do other things and coming from our different histories and why. So there are different levels of discourse and there are different angles of this discourse and they all come together. So um, intertextuality was used by Kristeva uh, for what Bartin called uh, hetero. In, in, the, in Slavic word, uh, languages, there is a word like Het, uh, really heterodiscursia. There are many discourses going on at the same time, informing each other in some unusual and surprising ways. If you just say the hetero uh, intertextuality, you are thinking mostly of texts, but not of real people who are here in on many different levels interacting with each other. Does it answer your question, Amy? <laughs> Yeah, I don't see her. I don't Amy. know. I okay. Don't think she's on Zoom. That, Maybe she's okay. just watching. Yeah. Okay, so it's her wife. But um, meanwhile, I'd like to ask a question on behalf of Jason. Of uh, I'll just share screen because he has written. He has actually written. I need to learn how to share screen here. Okay. He has uh, written the question. It's better for me to share. Can you see? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hi, Honor. I have for a long time been looking for a coherent theory to understand two things. Uh, number one, the use of 
image theater, forum theater, uh, or theater of the oppressed, to put students in imagined characters to explore social injustice issues, like marginalization of LGBTI people in imagined and real life situations. And number two, David Gonnet's use of Lego serious play to explore cultural identities, a creative visual method to investigate one's construction of the past, current, and future selves. So I think RCIC, CIP are great constructs for us to analyze what happens in play in the classroom. I have two questions regarding the play in education. Maybe you answer the first part of the question and I'll stop. Uh, I, I'll come back. Yeah, I'll well, I don't know what's his uh, first question. He just is uh, saying what he has been doing. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and let's go to the second part then. Uh, two questions we, regarding play and education as dialogic practices. Number one, I found that some students did get very involved as the characters in play. It seems play is very effective in making learners putting on new identities, which can enhance their empathy for others in the play. However, I found that after the play, students commented that in the real life, they may not act as they did in the play. Uh, so my question is, who can we ensure, how can we ensure what we want to achieve through play in your words in the service of preparation for life would translate into real actions in their life after or outside the play? Let's look at this question for the time being. Okay, I'll stop share and you answer these questions first. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things about educators is they want to uh, achieve uh, some change in the student that's pre-planned. And in that sense, they turn the whole experience, no matter how interesting it is, into this poiesis that is pre-planned by the teacher. So he wants to achieve that whatever happens in this uh, play uh, transfers into real life. And in that sense, he's not letting the students create their own internally persuasive discourse. And if, if you want to use, use other people's internally uh, persuasive discourse to achieve your goal, you're actually what Eugene would say, hijacking, I would use the same term, uh, other people's agency for your own purposes. We know from, uh, from history that the, one of the first people who talked about that was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who uh, in writing his Emile says the trick of the three teacher is to make the students love what they learn, but in fact they're learning it because you, may, you think it's important. And so in, in a way it's manipulation. A dialogic education uh, in itself, which doesn't have to be through play or not, uh, does uh, uh, some uh, ontological dialogic education, let me say that, are often things that that is ethically not okay because you're manipulating other people, not letting them create their own opinion, no matter how much you can disagree with that. Uh, all you ethically can do is to disagree and, and openly disagree and bring your, as an adult uh, uh, or a teacher, your own opinions and evidence and reasons. But at the end, you have to give the agency to the student to accept or not accept that. So if you, uh, we cannot ensure, uh, the, and we can, even if you're not in dialogic education, you cannot ensure that because people at the end always think what is internally persuasive to them, no matter how, and, and if you don't allow that, they'll hide it. <laughs> certainly, I certainly like that because this is such an antidote to the overseer's critical pedagogy people. Uh, Critical pedagogy people out of well-meaning mm -hmm. views. I want to change you because you are having a bad faith. You have false consciousness. I need to liberate you. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a very dangerous position to take. A dangerous position. Uh, yeah. I recommend dangerous. everyone to... Uh, uh, I will. I cannot remember now the name of that person, but uh, there was a. Uh, there is a whole movement uh, that's uh, trying to uh, uh, to warn people against 
uncritical using of the critical pedagogy or, or social justice motivations based on very bad things that happened on one campus in United States a uh, um, few years ago where a biology professor was uh, thrown out because of the huge uncritical movement of uh, uh, this white fragility, I don't know if you've heard of that whole movement, that, you know, just if you're born white, you must be racist. So we have to cleanse you from your racism because you just possibly cannot understand the suffering of, uh, of the black people or people of color. And it becomes so militant that you cannot even discuss anything critically because as the soon you add, utter anything that does not agree with that you are a trader, you can lose your job. So uh, everything, uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, dialogic pedagogy is very much uh, working against any kind of dogma, any kind of uh, preset uh, opinion, no matter how much you as a teacher think that that's the ultimate truth, that real education ha has to uh, open a freedom for a student to think with their own head and uh, reason with their own head. And if they come to a different conclusion, you may be sorry, you may, be, you may still disagree and, and try to change them, but it's not yours to change them. Yes, I understand that, Anna, just uh, to play the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, as the educator or teacher in the classroom, we also have a bottom line. When we see students and other, and uh, we cannot say in the in the spirit of being dialogic, I'll let you no, be your but classmates. I uh, also want <laughs> to add that schooling uh, in our real life does not consist only of education. And teacher has different hats. Sometimes yeah. teacher has to be a policeman or policewoman or police person and sometimes educator. And, uh, you know, like if I see a train coming or a car coming to uh, hit you, I will not engage you in dialogue to tell you how important is it for you not to stand in the middle of the street. I will pull you maybe even very uh, uh, forcefully off because this, uh, at that moment, it's not a time for education. Sometimes for uh, when there are dangerous bullying situations, it's time not to be an educator. But when the situation is over, you may then engage in education about what happened, why it happened, how it happened, who, who has the right or what, what to do about it when the heat of the moment is off. I understand. It's easier said than done. I can imagine a classroom scenario when some students are the profound fundamentalist Christians and then some people who are uh, friends of... Uh, 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 the LGBT people, mm -hmm. fundamentalist Christians will say it is a sin to be homo to be to be homosexual. It is wrong. You are going to hell. And then I can imagine how hurtful these remarks could be <laughs> to the other students who might happen to be homosexual. Or and then and then the Christians might also feel hurt. Feel hurt. It is my belief. So there, as a teacher, you're sandwiched between two theologies. As, as yeah. well, and then, what should I do as a teacher when you have such radical different theologies or belief systems in the classroom? It, there is no guarantee, but the uh, dialogic approach to that would be to sincerely examine both theologies together and. Uh, try to give them uh, for both reasons, for both axiologists to examine them for what their values are, the, what their purposes are, what their meaning in people's, uh, uh, in people's heads and in their families for them and to give both of them full right. And if, if you are able to engage students in a sincere talk about it, there is no guarantee, of course, because it's very hard to, you have to have a huge amount of trust but the only way how you can create a trust like that, if you accept both. As, as accept, not in the sense that you agree with them, but as, as their right to be and think like that, but also challenge them to think 
what from another point of view that could mean. You don't, I understand. You don't yeah, it's and important. it's clear that you're not trying to move them yourself this way or that way or to twist their hands, but that they have full right to freedom. And the only rule is to be civil to other people who they talk to, that's all. Exactly, exactly. that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Because as an educator, yes. you are so much. And uh, uh, I guess, yeah. space for I, both. Uh, there is an example in my sports sport presentation and paper of the student who I hurt a lot when I did not agree with her using of the uh, 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 reinforcement techniques on uh, autistic children and who almost broke down in my class because uh, I disagree with her. And uh, yeah, and then I got the uh, idea from Eugene how to uh, get out of this confrontation where I am right and she's wrong, but to start then examining uh, when and in what situation using Skinner techniques could be good and when it's not good and for what. So we could talk about like the different ways of thinking. So the educator herself or himself has to be ready to also re-examine their own thoughts. I understand. That's why so many educators don't engage in dialogic education because they don't want to get themselves into such a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And they, they are liable to they are liable to legal issues because they are responsible to create a safe space. And when we open it up to dialogue, both parties can charge the teachers, hey, teacher, you are creating a dangerous space. You are letting the other party to hurt me, right? So yeah. a lot of teachers can play safe. Okay, let's not talk about these sensitive issues. Let's stick to the agenda and go back to that, uh, that long dialogic form of education. <laughs> Uh, I think when we talk about education uh, that could take place from early ages on, where children of different cultures and different faiths and different uh, uh, belief systems encounter each other, where the teacher acknowledges they, that all of them have a right to, uh, to existence in some way, as long as they not annihilate the other that you create places with, uh, uh, create a way for people by modeling how that uh, you can relate to another person with whom you don't have to agree whatsoever, but still uh, respect them as, pe as a person. And I think in those situations, uh, 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 you can create safety in a sense, not risk free, but safety in the sense of respect to other people. You don't have to agree with and right. yeah i think uh, our bursts and unsafety comes mostly when when we are dealing with already uh, teenage or, or young adult people who have not experienced uh, this freedom of uh, critical thinking uh, in uh, as as a safe person right let, let us go to the second part of jason jason is uh, my former student from university of hong kong is now teaching in the Hong Kong U of Science and Technology. So this is the second part. When students play forum theater in my doctoral study, I found that the play could get really messy. When students were really into the play, most of them got really excited. Sometimes my students spoke and of course acted at the same time in the play. At the technical, I think it's methodological level. Uh, it poses challenges for researchers to conduct a detailed analysis. Uh, how can we deal with this messiness? This is a methodological question. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, as a researcher, uh, you know, many researchers destroy what they are researching in order to analyze it. Like we ki kill organisms in order to find out what's inside of them. We just dissect them as researchers. And so unless you want to kill the play, it has to be messy. And it poses, <laughs> so technologically, how to overcome that. Uh, uh, sometimes you just have to accept that there is no way how to overcome that. There would be potentially, you know, you can do all kinds of technological, like each person has their own microphone, which is only registering their own voice and nobody else's voice. 
and then you coordinate all of that. There, there, there could be all kinds of going around it, but never 100%. Because uh, you you cannot strap people into some contraptions <laughs> and expect them to act naturally, and also that that's one question. Another question for for a researcher is an ethical question: To what uh, uh, degree do we have a right to actually even look into these kinds of messy plays? Uh, is that ours to do? Uh, unless we are co-players there ourselves, and all the students who are playing there are co-researchers together. Because after all, it's something very intimate, play is intimate, and uh, the messier it becomes, the more riskier is that somebody else is going to then coldly analyze what was going on there, because it was not meant to be presented to other people. So unless all the players also are core researchers uh, who want to find out from different point of view more about themselves, uh, that's the question to ask yourself. How ethical is that to do? Not only how messy, but how ethical. <laughs> exactly, but uh, you, you aroused some interesting questions. I would like to go around our host uh, for you to ask your final question because we are really running late. So. <laughs> We'll start with Tsinghua. Yeah, any final or anything to say to Anna before we end our session? Oh, yeah, I would like to first thank Anna uh, about uh, this wonderful uh, lecture and the chance to engage. I think that I was not very into play in the past, but your, yeah, but your interesting article has opened the space for me to explore these issues too. So I'm very grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, Tinkwa. Alessia? Thank you so much, Anna, for this great discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed reading the articles, and I hope to read more on that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, thank you, and thank you for all your answers. Yeah, and, I, like, I'm with Tinkwa uh, on this one. I'm also going to explore it more and uh, try to apply in the best dialogic, let's say, way. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alessia. Thank you, Alasia. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk, especially I really enjoyed the differentiation of um, play, game, and praxis, and um, poesis, um, which really allows me to think more about this um, um, different, different ways. But also at the same time, I'm thinking about the unit of analysis, which is also related to uh, Jason's um, methodological question. And I could not, not think of Goffman's um, participation uh, framework, um, listeners and hearers um, dyadic or that different uh, multiplies this listeners um, and speakers dyadic um, position. And I wonder also what are the possibilities? Is it, is it can Goffman's um, understanding of this listener speaker roles or identities can be also applied um, to analyze notion of play and so forth. So that's just, I'm grappling with different ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Bongi, for this very interesting question and very interesting way to look at it. Uh, uh, I uh, know Goffman's work and uh, very early in my process of uh, becoming who I am now, looked at that very much. I found that it was inspiring, but uh, not enough, because I think uh, you cannot separate speaker-listener in the real situation, uh, uh, because we are both speakers and listeners all the time. Hi, April. Thanks, Bongi. April? very much uh, for the opportunity to engage in this dialogue. I've learned a lot, uh, um, not only from uh, Anna's talk and also from Anna's um, answers to other peers' questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, April, also for asking very interesting questions. Thanks, April. And Phoebe? And thank you very much, Anna. 
you learn a lot from your articles and PowerPoint and sharing today. I think in the future, if it's possible, maybe you can run an online drama workshop for more uh, participants to enjoy and you may showcase how you develop your dialogical uh, dialogic practices and also uh, do the chronotopic analysis with some mini scripts production. And then I'm sure that it will be very interesting to most of our audience and also the parents and teacher to learn through the process. Thank, Thank you. you. That's an interesting idea. I will have to look into that. <laughs> very, <Yeah>. very interesting. <laughs> And um, I want to thank Anna once more. Actually, your work is so fascinating and so multifaceted. We need to invite you again next year. So <laughs> there's so much to talk about. And also um, myself and a group of uh, students are thinking of setting up an international society for uh, semiotics research, translanguaging and transsemiotizing research. And we formally want to invite you as our honorary advisor. Oh, so, thank you very much. I yeah. don't know about that. Yeah. yeah, so we will keep you posted. We will, We are starting up a website, and so we will keep you posted. And for those who are still with us today, thank you so much. Please remember to give us a like and subscribe to our channel, set up the reminder for our upcoming seminars. So Tsinghua is going to share screen our two seminars. The next one is uh, in September, also a Friday. That will be Saturday in Asian time, the Friday in North American time. Uh, so Tsinghua can share screen of that uh, poster. And that's a professor. Our speaker will be uh, Professor Christiana dalton Kufa in the uh, University of Vienna. Her topic is Cognitive Discourse Functions in the Research of Content and Language Integrated Learning in CLEO. So it's very useful for a lot of us. And then in November, November, November 27, also a Friday, we will have a very uh, exciting a cognitive scientist and a forerunner and a good friend of Jay Lamke's, <laughs> um, Michael, Ruth Michael Roth and uh, from University of Victoria in Canada, and also Paul Thibault from Norway. They will talk about trans analysis and the issue of causality. So, so we have an exciting program coming up. And once more, thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Angel and uh, Alessia, Bongi, April, Phoebe, and of course, Jinghua a lot for this uh, wonderful, I don't know how. Well, before we, we end, Amy, you come online back. Yeah, I, I need to let you say something <laughs> before we end the section. Amy, thank you come, for coming back. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yes. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I was actually offline due to some network problem. And it's kind of uh, wonderful to still being able to join back. And and and, and I feel that this uh, seminar uh, broadened my um, understanding of uh, the Bactinian dialogism and also uh, notions of more, uh, notions like chronotope. Um, it's kind of, a, uh, and also play, um, it's kind of both also uh, many critical issues are discussed. So I will, I, I just feel that um, there's some more um, uh, heartfelt uh, feeling and meaning added to my research in not only in terms of um, practicality, but also in terms of um, the mission of being an, a socially responsible educate, uh, educational researcher. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, April. Okay, so thank you. It's almost uh, two hours now. We also break our record. So yes. I is here to share the future seminars posters and our International Society for Translanguaging and Transsemiotizing Research will be set up soon. And Honor has already promised to be our honorary advisor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Until next time, please keep safe. And I miss all of us so much. I miss touching you, embracing you, hiking with you, going together into the mountains. I really miss all those days. Let's hope that everybody is safe. Thank oh, you. Back to everywhere. To all our student hosts and our postdoc hosts. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time. Until bye -bye. next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>